Let's begin. Welcome again to the Greenfield Cities Alliance Dialogues, Episode 3. I'm your host, Greg Lindsay from New Cities, and um, we're here to convene an incredible session on cities, sovereignty, and citizenship. Um, for those of you who have followed, of course, the history of extraterritoriality, special economic zones, and of course today, Greenfield Cities, you know that part of their whole conceit for being has always been the fact that they exist outside, in many cases, of their home territory. Um, going back, of course, to some of the original special economic zones uh, in the United States following World War II, where, of course, trade laws did not apply, evolving through, of course, China's special economic zones, which spawned entire cities from scratch, such as Shenzhen, um, to today. And of course, uh, we, have, we have several participants joining us, uh, of course, from the UAE, uh, where Dubai, 20 years ago, began to very effectively leverage this strategy and take it even further uh, with such projects as the Dubai International Finance Center, which has its own sort of extraterritorial legal code, where the highest court of the land is actually in Britain. Um, and today, of course, we have some great, fantastic practitioners here to talk about how they have further experimented with sort of pushing sovereignty there. And so I'll quickly introduce um, our, our fantastic group of panelists and sort of and discuss also the opportunities um, that these kinds of new forms of citizenship and territoriality open up. So I'm delighted to be joined today uh, by Ruth Annis, who is the Director General of Citizenship and Migration Policy for the Ministry of Interior in Estonia, the pioneers of e-residency, don't leave home without it. Um, also joined by uh, His Excellency Gabriel Abed, who is the Ambassador of Barbados, to the United Arab Emirates. Speaking of sovereignty, of course, congratulations to Barbados on become, recently becoming a, a republic. Um, also joined by Mansour Hanif, who is the Executive Director of Emerging Technologies at NIAM, which of course is the Saudi massive uh, extraterritorial project there, city and territory. Uh, and then also Lorraine Charles, co-founder and executive, dire executive director of Na'an Mall, which is an organization connecting refugees with remote work opportunities. And finally, Atusa Abrahamian, who is the author of The Cosmopolites uh, about frontiers of citizenship and who's currently working on a new book about extraterritoriality. So thank you all so much for, for joining us today. Thank you all so much who are watching and listening. Um, I think this is gonna be a fantastic session and let's begin. Um, I wanna turn to Ruth first because I think sort of some of the roots of what we're discussing here, uh, if we sort of start with Dubai in 2000 and forward to the next major development, it was the creation of the Estonian e-residency program, which I think is now about seven years old. And this, of course, and I won't step on you, Ruth, but you know, this is the first program in which a nation state created a sort of form of digital residency in which people could do banking and start businesses in Estonia and thereby the EU without actually ever setting foot in it. And, and Ruth, I, if you could sort of quickly introduce the program, its aims of the time and how it's evolved, because it really is sort of the forerunner of everything that we're talking about. About today. Hello, yes, uh, we have had our e-society uh, since 2002 and um, of course we gradually developed it and when we had all our e-services in place uh, we have more than 5,000 e-services. We thought that if we have already such a nice digital society why not share it uh, with uh, uh, people from other countries because physically moving is a, a very hard decision, but uh, people can stay uh, in their uh, environment where they feel comfortable and just join Estonian needs society by uh, virtually. So uh, we have had our in residency since uh, 1st of December, 2014. And uh, currently uh, we have around uh, 56,000 happy e-residents who have a valid e-residence card. Um, so basically it's kind of a popular thing, I would say. We have fans, we have businessmen uh, from different countries. And uh, of course, we, uh, it's a win-win-win situation. So an e-resident uh, gets a chance to do business globally, establish and manage a company remotely, uh, and get uh, location independence, uh, then the country of origin gets a person who can maintain himself or herself and the family and the income taxes paid by the e-resident. And Estonia gets bigger economy and taxes uh, paid for the services used in Estonia. So it's a, it's a wonderful program and a win-win-win situation. 
Thank Fantastic. You. Thank you. And then quickly, you know, where do you see the program evolving? I mean, it's seven years old. You have significant numbers in the tens of thousands. I mean, I think it's almost 100,000 e-residents now. And then, and then in July 2020, you launched the Nomad Visa. So how does digital yep. residency align with the Nomad Visa? And what does this say about the future of, of residency and citizenship for Estonia? I mean, will we see a full-fledged digital citizenship, perhaps? And what would that even mean? Yeah, Digital Nomad, Nomad Visa is uh, another uh, our e-society project uh, because it's more and more common to have uh, a digital lifestyle and uh, people can buy uh, remote working and tourism, uh, which means that uh, yeah, they want to uh, work remotely and uh, uh, you know travel around the world. So we launched a Digital Nomad Visa program uh, on the 1st of August last year uh, and uh, we are thinking uh, kind of you know maybe in the future to combine new residents and the uh, digital nomad visa and all, all of these people are most welcome uh, to Estonia of course uh, because of the COVID uh, restrictions we currently have issued only uh, 167 visas because obviously we can't say that it's essential travel. If you can work remotely, obviously we don't have to come to Estonia. But yeah, we see a future for this program and maybe combining these together would be a good idea. Wonderful, thank you. Well, obviously you mentioned there, you know, obviously COVID restrictions sort of uh, led to in many ways places the genesis of these digital nomad policies, which the two original, of course, Barbados launched the first, I believe, by a matter of weeks ahead of Estonia's. Um, and then, of course, we've seen nations across the EU and across the world have launched similar programs. So COVID created this impetus for more lightweight forms of citizenship and thinking about this. But even before that, of course, in 2015 was, of course, the Syrian civil war and the wave of migration that it unleashed, uh, in which you know European governments grappled with, I think, the beginning of future waves of migration. And this is obviously a pivot to Lorraine here on this. Is that you're working with Naamal, you, know, uh, you know, we have, of course, uh, you know, a crisis of migration. We have governments that are very eager to keep people out, but also how do we create opportunities for them? And this is one of the things with Greenfield Cities has been discussed going back to Paul Romer's Charter Cities concept more than a decade ago. Lorraine, can you talk a bit about your work there and about what it sort of points to in terms of, you know, we have, you know, more migrant, more refugees today than, than at the end of World War II, I believe is the widely quoted statistic. Um, how do we begin thinking about, you know, where will they live? Where will they go? How, you know, beyond simply taking them into the nation states, how can we begin to connect them to globalization and think about, you know, new places for them to live and can, you know, I guess the sort of question, where do greenfield cities, these new forms of citizenship and new forms of remote work all start to entwine? Yeah, thank you. Um, so first of all, I mean, uh, if, if we sort of think about the genesis of, of, of migration, people migrate for opportunity and people migrate to flee, you know, to flee conflict, um, you know, to flee wars. And, you know, of course the two are very different. You know, it, leaving to flee a war, that's an international human right. So refugees have a right to seek refuge in a host country. And, you know, and, you know, and that's enshrined by the UN. So when refugees are in a, are in a, a safe country, often more safe countries that refugees go to, most initial host countries are developing countries, which themselves struggle to economically, to economically um, look after their own populations. So they're in a situation where they aren't, a, um, where they struggle to integrate into the local economy because there aren't enough jobs to accommodate for them. So what often happens, and, and you know, often what we've seen is refugees leaving Turkey, which is theoretically safe, um, Jordan, which is theoretically safe, Northern Iraq, which is safe, to go to Europe because of lack of opportunity. So how can we then bring opportunity to, to people where they are? And this is the big, you know, and this is the, you know, this is what COVID has shown us. Prior to COVID, when we talked about remote work, it was seen as a sort of white middle class, North American, North European thing. You're a digital nomad, you're, you're educated, you're usually male, that's perhaps a demographic. What COVID has shown us is that remote work can be for anyone. It's accessible to everyone. So how can we use this opportunity, to, you know, this situation to bring opportunity to people where they are so they can migrate by choice, not by necessity? And I'm not talking about refugees fleeing conflict. I'm talking about people who, who are leaving because they have no opportunity where they are. We know there's a talent shortage in the West. So how can we now navigate this space to accommodate for people 
who can have the jobs which they would have if they lived in London or Paris. Why do we have to live in these cities to have the good jobs? Why can't they be opportunity for people who don't live in these global capitals? So this is where, you know, I mean, for me, remote work is a democratization of employment. How can we bring employment to people where they are? So governments haven't caught up with that. We have to sort of grapple with how to, how to legislate this situation and how do we see these individuals living in one direction often where perhaps and it's not their host, their home country, but working for a, a com company host, um, registered in another country. So we have all of these things to navigate. Wonderful. Yes, I, I thought of you the right. I, you're, you're right when you talk about the democratization of remote, remote work, because part of the one of the things I was thinking about at this, or how do we begin to think about um, these new forms of residency and citizenship? Is you're absolutely right. You know, the, the nomad, the digital nomad cliche, and they've done studies on this is exactly true. It's single dudes in their 30s who are typically in software, and these are of course the, the sort of talented workers that governments compete to have. When there's of course an incredible amount of talent in in refugees and other migrants, and you know, I thought of this or started thinking about this when I was in Albania. I was actually in Tirana in October. And and of course, you know, uh, they've you know taken in 3,000 Afghan refugees there, which you know prorated the size of the United States would be more than half a million. Um, you know, you start to get past some of the political issues. If you can think about, we can settle them here and have them earn global incomes and perhaps push past some of those local politics of you know refugees or migrants will take our jobs. If you can create places and communities where they can then integrate and have some of that opportunities, and so it sort of points to the, perhaps the stakes here. Um, I just want to know for our audience here, uh, by the way, please start submitting questions here. I, you know, I'm certainly not the kind of person who's going to wait to the very end to take your questions. I've got a several for our, all of our panelists, but we'll start working them in as they come in. So please leave questions in the Q&A or in the chat even, uh, and we'll start to get them from there. Uh, but now I want to sort of pivot future. You know, we sort of laid out the stakes and why this is necessary. And, and um, I want to talk to uh, His Excellency Gabriel Abed here. Uh, about sort of where the future of this goes. Because as I mentioned, you know, Barbados, of course, it's tourism, of course, crushed during the pandemic, in, it became incredibly innovative in that visa policy. And now you recently have become the first ambassador of the nation to the UAE. And, and of course, announced plans to establish an, uh, an embassy in the metaverse, working with Decentraland to acquire land. Um, uh, Gabriel, if you could talk a bit about this. I know your background is in, is in cryptocurrencies, and I'm curious how you're thinking about extending what it means to be a nation state for Barbados as it sort of navigates these new terrains of supposedly decentralized currencies, and of course, also this new projection into the metaverse. Um, so I think it's pretty important to note that uh, we are embarking as a nation to reimagine our identity and what that looks like in the construct of where the future is going. You know, Barbados is a place that has a lot of talented individuals. We, we truly are blessed from that regard where we have a, a subset of our citizens who are really global pioneers, but uh, it's, it's about creating that environment for them. Um, and what's pretty important here is that as a small nation, you know, we're, we're just 166 square miles. And that kind of limits us when it comes to the global stage in terms of uh, how feasible it is to have parity uh, with other nations such as G20 nations. So the, the embarkment on this metaverse embassy is really a mean towards uh, getting us in a position where we're preparing for the future. Because when we think about it, uh, we're quite limited uh, on the global stage when it comes to diplomatic parity. And embarking on this type of mission really starts to look at this from an experimentational point of view of what would it take for us to have diplomatic missions with 197 countries around the world? What would that look like in terms of, um, in terms of establishment, in terms of negotiations, in terms of having a seat at the table and vice versa, being reciprocal to those nations also having similarly a seat at our table? So this is a mission towards uh, bringing about that level of fairness in the global space of diplomacy. And I say fairness, not that the, the space with diplomacy is unfair, but rather the, the natural position we find our in as a small island developing state. And more importantly, this also provides uh, avenue for other developing nations and small island developing states to also embark on these types of initiatives where they utilize technology and innovation to really advance um, their digital diplomacy. Uh, it's pretty important to also touch on the key points. You know, the subject of the day is climate change. And when we look at the, 
the, the reasons of why this remote work is happening, uh, why it makes sense, why it doesn't always uh, play out best to keep jumping on planes and flying around the world, this starts to also open up the avenue of, well, maybe this type of initiative makes a lot of sense. And then also from the vein of COVID and the restrictions, the lockdowns, you know, we saw a period where many of the embassies around the world couldn't be opened because of the restrictions and the risks that um, those workers or those persons looking to visit the embassy would have faced. So this also provides a new avenue to begin challenging that specific issue. Um, but I think what's also important to note is we're preparing our nation for the future. And it's by embarking on these types of innovations uh, that we, we provide a, a lookout post, if you will, for our citizens to uh, understand what this technology means, what it can mean to them. Because Barbados is a place that not only has talent on the innovational side of things, we have raw talent from the creation uh, side of things. You know, we have a lot of musicians, we have artists, uh, we have beautiful dance and culture. And this becomes a way as well of demonstrating that, of being able to portray it and then merging that with the field of innovation to allow the world to also experience that. So all in all, this is, this is an experiment that is really an attempt to ensure that we're preparing for the future because as we are rightfully seeing, the metaverse is a trending subject. And you don't wanna wait to the entire world is on board to then start looking at how we can be participants. It makes a lot of more sense right now for us to become early pioneers, for us to become uh, those who are building the table rather than being invited to sit at another table and then being able to be part of those conversations for where the future is going. Because ultimately, this is a new area of driving uh, creation of jobs, uh, creation of opportunities, um, creation of uh, diplomatic parity, as I mentioned earlier. And it's an avenue for us to really reimagine what we look like as a nation on the global stage. So that's, that's an initiative that we're embarking on on many different fronts. And for us, the way we see this is it removes the limitation of us being a small island developing state and puts us in a position of being a global player. No, absolutely. I, I say, uh, we'll, we'll come back to this in particular to discuss how with you and Ruth and Mansoor, how Web3 technologies interact with this and think about how nation states get projected into that. But, but first, I'm going to go to Mansoor on this because uh, obviously this is the Greenfield Cities Di Alliance Dialogues. And so, you know, you're the one building a Greenfield City on this. Uh, you know, we have great representatives from existing nation states. Uh, who are experimenting in this. I say Estonia and Barbados both put the lie to the idea that governments can't innovate. It's great, great seeing such government innovators here. Uh, but Mansoura, you know, how is, how is NEOM actually oper operationalizing this? Because of course, part of the whole discussion around the project is that in addition to its sheer size, I think Belgium is the most common comparison. Um, it is believed that there will be a sort of extra set of territorial that taking that DIFC model and extending it further to imagine what sort of federated governance can be. And then of course, there's the technology piece. So can you talk a bit about that, I guess, and sort of like how you see this since you are building it from scratch and designing that governance from scratch, or at least your colleagues are, um, how do you imagine the intersection of these trends and how would you sort of carry it forward as part of NEOM's effort to basically build a population from scratch since it's mostly uninhabited right now when it comes to attracting these kinds of uh, global talented workers, et cetera. Yeah, great, no, thanks. Thanks for inviting me to the session. And uh, it's great to hear the other views because effectively we are very different to everybody else um, for reasons which I'll describe now. So we're coming at this from a completely different angle. But at the same time, you can see the convergence across what we're hearing from everybody. And effectively what we're trying to do is to converge these different streams that are uh, available now into building the future. Mm -hmm. So first of all, it's, it's important to acknowledge that our goal is, is, and our mission is quite simple. It's as an accelerator of human progress. So, um, so that's what we are here for. That's what the mission of NEOM is. And um, uh, that really drives everything we do. And the three pillars that we have are increased sustainability, livability, and economic progress and diversification, which, which are driving that, uh, that operation, operationalization. And this was already our mission right from the very beginning. But um, I think during the post, during the COVID era that we've just been living through and are still living through, and you know, hoping for a post-COVID era to start soon, um, those three elements I think became central to everybody's lives. 
and we really understood, you know, what does what does livability mean or or not mean when it's taken away from you, and and it also allowed us to understand the importance of sustainability, and effectively how we can um, utilize better digital technologies. So we're coming at it from I would say the difference of what we're doing here. You mentioned we're the size of Belgium, so we're not a city, we're not a DIFC, we're not even an economic free trade zone. We are a whole region with a huge scale and scope of our ambitions. It's the most ambitious project in the world. Mm -hmm. So geographically speaking, you could say mm -hmm. we're a network of cities. We've announced two of the major um, urban um, areas within NEOM so far, but there's more to come. The first one was the line. Which is, uh, which is a new model of, um, of living together for the future. And even along the line, it's a network of, of uh, cities along the line, which is 170 kilometers long. So that's where our, most of our urban population is gonna be. And then two weeks ago, you may have heard of Oxagon, which is our um, industrial um, clean, clean manufacturing center. And it's also a floating city. So you can imagine that uh, what we're trying to do has never been really attempted before. So when people say, you know, this is incredible, it's like an opportunity of a lifetime. It's not actually true. The scale and scope of what we're trying to achieve is, is a unique opportunity in history. That's the scale and scope of the ambition. I would say perhaps the last time this happened in history was maybe 2000 years ago when um, Alexander the Great asked his generals to draw a line in the sand, not too far from here, and created a new city called Alexandria, which was actually part of Egypt, but it was an accelerator of the technologies and uh, the convergence of many streams of civilization of the time. And it actually drove human progress for a thousand years. So that's the kind of scale and scope of ambition that we have now with the added incentive that we now have the technologies and these amaz amazing te technical digital capabilities that we can bring together to converge to create new realities. So first of all, I think it's important also to recognize this to Lorraine's points. We are part of the 2030 uh, vision, Saudi vision. And part of that is enabling people around the world, uh, especially in the Middle East and Africa, which is closest to us, to have equal access to a digital future. And one of the things we've done so far is, for example, we recently announced a joint venture with OneWeb the LEO um, uh, constellation. Uh, and through that, we will be providing access to um, a, a wide range of African countries and Middle Eastern countries. And as part of that, we hope to enable uh, the populations there to have equal access to digital infrastructure and digital capabilities and a digital future. So it very much links to what Lorraine was saying about uh, uh, balancing up opportunities and making sure that there's a, there's a more equitable future for everybody. Um, and that also leads to the remote work. So um, to, to Gabriel's point about uh, metaverses and the opportunities that they offer, we consider the, the cities that we're building from scratch as meta cities, because we're designing them as mixed reality cities from the very beginning. And the metaverse that we're building as part of NEOM, uh, starting with the digital side first, will allow remote access, integrating the connectivity and infrastructure that we're building as part of our cognitive city infrastructure to people from around the world to not only remotely work in NEOM, but also come to NEOM and experience these mixed realities um, firsthand as well through technologies such as a, a digital breakout. And I, so I think you can see that there's a fundamental shift in the way we look at residency and location and place and remote, not just remote working, but remote experience. It's all about the human experience. And I could go on about this for quite a while, but I would just point out that uh, the key thing about this is to really be clear from the beginning about what you're trying to achieve. And uh, because we have this role with the very clear pillars of what we want to achieve, uh, we have um, a design principle, which has three pillars. One is security by design, making sure that everybody feels safe and secure, whether it's in the metaverse or whether it's accessing these, um, these mixed reality installations in NEO. Secondly, though, we've added to that sustainability by design, because we need to make sure that everything we do is looked at from the point of view of sustainability right from the very beginning. And the third pillar is humanity by design. And that means that while we're, we're going to have a huge focus on technology to enable all of these cognitive cities, 
we need to make sure that those technologies are at the service of humanity and are built around humanity's needs and, uh, and, and desires and basically creating new opportunities for ourselves rather than actually suppressing our humanity. Excellent, thank you. All right, well, I would come to, on this first pass around to Atusa. Um, everything we've discussed so far, of course, is mostly through the context of traditional sovereignty and nation states. I mean, you know, a sovereign project in Neom, representatives of two governments here and discussing, of course, you know, traditional boundaries to, to refugees. Uh, Atusa, I know you have been following the rise of the completely efforts to create completely privatized city states. Um, and Sewer mentioned a floating city. An idea more recently associated with, of course, seasteading, and we've seen efforts like in Honduras, uh, where you know the uh, Prospera there created out of Paul Romer's proposal ten years ago, um, and then of course more recently uh, crypto cities such as City Dow and Praxis and others. And and Atusa, I guess can you talk a bit about these because these are efforts, of course, to slip you know using city based. Uh, technologies combined with Web3 to slip sovereignty altogether if possible. And I guess the question is, can they succeed? How might they succeed? What, what does that look like as well? Yeah, so I'll talk a little bit about the really big picture and, and actually how some of the things that you're mentioning have, have evolved and it's a little back to the future. So um, around, so in the early to mid 2010s between uh, let's say 2005 and 2011, um, there were a couple of big ideas um, being kicked around in, in the universe that we all inhabit. Um, Paul Romer, Nobel Prize winning economist, very creative guy, uh, had a TED talk and a paper and uh, did a lot of media around this idea of charter cities. And the basic, I'm really oversimplifying, basic idea is there are countries in the world that are having a really hard time. They have not great governments, not great laws. Um, for whatever reason, they're in bad shape and the people there are not doing well. What if we got, say, Canada to come in, administer a portion of the territory, bring in good laws, bring in good regulations, train bureaucrats, you know, have a little island. I think island of prosperity is the cliche that keeps coming up in this world. And once, say, Canada is in charge of a little piece of neighborhood or, or you know, region, um, people there will have access to these good laws and institutions. Companies will obviously come rushing in to take advantage of these you know, good laws and also less expensive labor. Um, and the rising tide will lift all boats. Um, people will not have to leave a place like Honduras or El Salvador in order to have good jobs. Um, they won't have to leave even for good security because Canada is gonna take care of that. You get the gist. The thing is, this was very provocative, right? Because this brings back a lot of memories of colonialism and imperialism. And, and this historically has not been a particularly equitable um, arrangement for the country where these experiments are taking place. Um, so, you know, the obvious alternative is what if it's a corporation instead? The thing is, you don't need Canada for this. and. Countries have never needed Canada for this, and they will not need Canada for this. No offense to Canada. I'm Canadian. Greg, I know you're in Canada. Canada's wonderful. We don't need Canada. Because for centuries, countries have already been experimenting within their own territory, using their own sovereignty to kind of manipulate um, the laws of a portion of the territory. Uh, this has, you know, if you go back to the Renaissance, we had free ports in Europe um, that allowed foreigners to trade more freely, um, even religious minorities, right? This was a way for these very kind of at the time religious societies to say, okay, we can have Jews, we can have Armenians, we can have all these people from around the world, they can trade here, but not, you know, in the rest of the country. And so that's a way of avoiding the political issues, right? Like, do we actually want an inclusive society? Maybe we're not ready for that, but we would like some trade, please. So it's a way of splitting the difference. Um, after, this is a very potted history of free ports. After the kind of port model, um, we had um, imperial powers using colonies and uh, specifically island nations to do much of the same thing, right? Things that were not permissible at home in terms of trade. So like smuggling, piracy trading with other empires, which was not kosher at the time. Um, you could do that in um, a, a free port or a you know, colonized area in um, Southeast Asia, Africa, Caribbean, et cetera. Um, again, these are not particularly happy memories for the people who were the subject of these places, but it shows that again, you don't, you don't need Canada because countries have 
in their power um, the capacity to do this. Of course, institutions like the EU, the WTO, they put a cap on how much you can do, um, especially in terms of tariffs and stuff like that. Uh, but, but the point is that the territory law um, regulations, these are not a bundle that is inextricable, right? You can, you can peel off parts of this as we're seeing um, you know, at the DIFC, I'm obsessed with DIFC. This is the Dubai International Financial Center um, where you know, the laws of Dubai, the laws of the UAE are different from the regulations and laws for the companies in the DIFC. You can borrow law, you can cobble together a set of really uh, business friendly regulations for the benefit of the companies that are operating there. And, you know, arguably, right, this is really depends case by case, arguably also for the benefit of the population that is outside of these boundaries. Um, I say arguably because it can really, really vary. Um, this is something that I've encountered in my research about special economic zones is that you can't say they're good or they're bad or they work or they don't work. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't work. Sometimes it's just business as usual. Um, as one person who I spoke to who consults in a lot of these zones said, garbage in, garbage out, right? <laughs> Which isn't very friendly, but you get the picture. Like you can't, and I think this comes back to Romer, um, his idea, you can't create a wonderful set of institutions in a place where the procedures and the processes and their, you know, d democracy doesn't really work. So um, that's kind of the limit, I think, of these experiments. And that isn't to say that they don't work, but th it's a lot more complicated than swooping in and creating, um, you know, a new city from scratch. The reason that it works in a place like Dubai is that there's very strong leadership and there's a lot of money. Um, I think that you could say the same about um, a, an experiment like Neom, right? Really strong leadership, maybe too strong, <laughs> um, lots of money, maybe too much. Um, but that these power is what makes these things happen. And I, and I think that when we have conversations about these types of initiatives, we can't forget the power imbalances that exist in the world every day that in a lot of ways, these experiments are looking to rectify, but they're still there. Um, so I'll stop. I'll stop for now. I'll come. I'll come back to that. We thank. Thank you all so much. I know I, we could talk about this all day. Unfortunately, we only have another about twenty-five, maybe thirty minutes if we push it. So we'll, we'll try to. I'm going to do two sets of questions for, for panelists, and then we'll. Uh, I'll take one from the audience. And again, the audience members, please drop in questions. Um, so I want to go back to some of the, the technological because there's some really interesting concepts that you also laid out there, Tusa and others. And so I want to go to Ruth and Gabriel and Mansoor in this, again, coming back to sort of the tech side of this, which is this idea that, yes, this unbundling, the technological unbundling of some of these layers. And that's what e-residency to me was sort of the first step in, in the sense of, you know, the ability to reside physically somewhere in the world and yet be from a taxation regulatory standpoint in a completely different jurisdiction was a sort of breakthrough. Perhaps, you know, going back to Alexandria, I don't know we were going to introduce some deep cuts here on Greenfield Cities Mentor, but, but that's what Estonia did. And then yes, and we've talked about the metaverse. To me, the more resonant example from Snow Crash, Neil Stevenson's book that inspired the metaverse was Mr. Lee's Greater Hong Kong, which those of you who, are, who enjoy this book remember, imagined a sort of franchise citizenship where you could walk into a consulate of Mr. Lee's Greater Hong Kong and suddenly have a sort of localized citizenship in which you had extra, extra powers. And that sort of points to somewhere where this is going, that you know, the notion that I could have an Estonian e-residency in the world, starting to imagine what these, you know, what perhaps this consulate doesn't exist uh, physically as much, but in the metaverse, the fact that I could exist into the metaverse and suddenly I have a Barbadian set of rights and regulations there that could be special is to me very interesting. And of course, Neom takes us further. Um, so I guess the first question on this and for the three of you is, is Ruth, can you talk a bit about um, or thoughts on you know, again, what is theoretically possible with e-residency? I mean, is it possible given the fact that, you know, Estonia has its own powerful, flexible technology for this, that we could see federated e-residencies? Could Estonia create new alliances with other regions where, you know, perhaps there is a sort of virtual Estonia that applies to other physical locales perhaps? Or I'm curious where, where you sort of see the theoretical possibilities for a small nation state like Estonia, as Gabriel said, to project your own soft power out into the world. So what, what does it mean to be an a, a e-resident or a citizen of Estonia with these kinds of technological powers? Um, yeah, we are very happy to, uh, uh, you know, our ICT is our speciality. So, uh, and uh, combining it uh, with uh, uh, our 
digital nomad visa. We also have startup visa program. Uh, so it's uh, one thing is uh, to uh, really uh, uh, easy the life of, of people uh, who really uh, either they can't move or, or at least give them an opportunity for better life. Uh, another thing is uh, why we have these uh, uh, projects uh, is to uh, make Estonia uh, bigger. And uh, when Estonia uh, is uh, already you know, known as an ICT uh, state, uh, yes, it's also very good actually for the, you know, uh, for the economy because uh, ICT services are the ones that can be exported. For example, it would be very difficult to export uh, uh, constructions uh, because when you build a house, it's there. You can't uh, move around the world and build houses. Some, someone has to buy them. But these services are those that really can be exported. And of course, it's uh, uh, important that Estonia has a say in uh, which way the, the world will develop in ICT. And uh, you know, these, uh, yeah, as I said, remote uh, working, um, obviously, yeah, you know, uh, people work in, in uh, one uh, country, they do businesses in another, and um, people maybe don't like the climate of Estonia very much, but because it's quite cold here, um, but uh, they can be part of our e-society. And our e-residents, actually, uh, they, they have formed their own community. So it's uh, they are helping each other, they are talking with each other, and uh, it's um, they are already part of the Estonian society and Estonian community. And what, why not uh, uh, combine it uh, uh, with some other programs uh, from other countries? Because, uh, for example, the digital nomads, uh, they uh, like to do, like uh, live uh, one uh, month in one uh, city, then uh, two months in another city. They move around and they do remote work. So it's, uh, it definitely would be an interesting uh, uh, cooperation with other states as well. Interesting. Well, perhaps Barbados could be one of them. Um, Gabriel, obviously, you, you know, you've thought a ton about this when it comes to the Web3 aspect. I mean, obviously, we've seen, you know, a huge burst of interest in DAOs and, of course, thinking, of course, about, you know, multiple cities minting their own tokens. You know, CityCoin is working with Miami, you know, Reno, Nevada in the United States is doing this as well. Where, where does, you know, again, I, I guess building off that question, you know, where, where does the future point to from the Barbadian Metaverse Embassy? And also, again, thinking through the intersection of these Web3 technologies that, you know, would, evolve, would involve potential... Uh, you know, benefits beyond certain levels of sovereignty. Or, I, it's, it's a hard mansion to imagine. I know you're, you're the, the visionary behind this, but I'm curious how you're thinking about building out this extensible set of Barbados into these other realms. I should probably note that at this current point, since we're speaking about the future, these would be my opinions and not necessarily reflective of the plans of our government. Duly done. Um, but when I do look at the Metaverse Embassy as a prospect, for us to expand beyond our current limitations and really open up the door to how we redefine the way that we interact around the world. It does lead to a interesting thought experiment of where if we are limited based on our territorial waters um, and what we can do with other nation states, what happens when that limitation goes away, when you start to define a virtual environment where you have sovereignty over a piece of decentralized real estate. And when you have that virtual real estate that belongs to your nation, what could you do with other nations? Um, what could you embark on? Uh, I mean, for example, could it be a situation where Estonia and Barbados start to share an EID program between themselves in this new meta environment? And the question then leads to what else can you create together? What else can you share? What else can exist for the future digital nomad, for those entrepreneurs that are creating the next generation of digital businesses that don't necessarily need to be landlocked? How do you then start to uh, provide an environment for those types of persons to want to exist in this new virtual sovereign uh, a multilateral relationship based environment. 
And that's really the way that, that we're seeing this. The, the Metaverse Embassy is merely just a start of a multi-phase project. And uh, right now, while it might be an experiment, it is the right foot in the door towards how do you embark on those types of diplomatic relationships? How do you ensure you're meeting uh, the criteria of international law? How do you ensure that you bring other nation states into the fold while sharing your knowledge, uh, your technology, sharing the know-how and the potential? And then how do you start embarking on the next level of conversation where it's, hey, if you're coming into my metaverse embassy and you're getting this e-visa, where does that e-visa lead you to? And what kind of possibilities can you use against that e-visa to create? Uh, and that's really where this is leading. So without, without going into uh, detail on some of our plans, uh, what I can say is that this opens up the door dramatically for Barbados to no longer be limited by its size and its geography. It then sets a playing field of saying that any developing nation or any nation in general can now participate where their size is no longer an issue, but instead uh, their creativity and what they're bringing to the table is the substance that really matters. Great, thank you. And then quickly, Mansoor, I mean, you mentioned, you know, the fact that you're going to extend, uh, you know, using low Earth orbit satellites to extend digital infrastructure to sub-Saharan Africa. My immediate thought when you said that was, is this the sort of the foundations for a sort of NEOM, uh, you know, e-residency -E as well, that, you know, the nations that participate in your infrastructure could then perhaps potentially participate in the local economy as well. I mean, is that some of the thinking here about creating new forms of, yeah, distributed infrastructure that could then tie into that? Or how do you imagine that as well? And also with the, the, the augmented reality aspect of it as well, you can imagine people participate participating in NEOM in an augmented reality sense, perhaps where they are or they're projecting themselves into NEOM, even if they're not physically there. I mean, how do we start to see that blurring as well? No, absolutely. And as, as I mentioned before, our outreach is more about giving digital access uh, equitably to people who don't have it today and creating new opportunities for them, whether it's remote working or not. And some of the technologies we're, we're using to build the cognitive cities in NEOM can be transported to enhance that experience. Now you mentioned AR, for example. So in our, in our metaverse, the cognitive verse, uh, we will have a subscription model whereby people can actually access the physical universe in Neon through either being projected as an AR uh, uh, representation. That would mean people can see you if they're wearing AR glasses in Neon or as a hologram, which is, so the hologram technology is expanding and being changed and we're going to make it available across all our public infrastructure so you could beam in as a hologram and interact with people in real time as a hologram from Africa or from anywhere else in the world or as a robot robotic avatar and uh, that's when you can actually manipulate objects and, and you know, have a proper job you know and play football with somebody if you want so this is the type of physical breakout we're enabling that, that makes us totally different because no other metaverse can do that because you're not nobody else is building mixed reality cities now the question of whether that is an e-residency or not, uh, we haven't really gone, I can't really go into details right now, but you can think about retransforming everything into a subscription basis, whereby people can decide how they want to be perceived by other people, how they want, you know, what, what value they get out of it, and they can choose whatever suits their uh, subscription model. And I think, you know, in terms of attracting people to Neom, I think at the moment, our focus is on really catering for the huge amount of people who want to come to Neom today, and we're you know, accelerating our plans to build these infrastructures to, to receive them because the, the reality is there are millions of people around the world who want to accelerate human progress and buy into the mission. And they realize that places like the line and Oxacon are unique in the world. So that's the, the number one priority, but we're already very advanced in the laws for uh, uh, NEOM. So we're about to, we're a couple of months away, we think from the enactment of the founding law of NEOM which would effectively be on a, a part of the Kingdom, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia laws. So we would be effectively a, a state within a state. So a semi-autonomous region within KSA. And uh, as part of those laws, I mean, I think, you know, Atusa has got a point that, you know, um, it's not so easy to create new realities, but when you've actually got uh, the infrastructure and the cities being designed from the beginning uh, for these new realities, and at the same time, you have the flexibility around the laws and, reg and regulations, new emerging areas like the metaverse, et cetera, we have absolute flexibility to adapt the laws and regulations that we will be adopting here 
to actually learn, learn progressively and, and perhaps help other regions to understand what are the laws and regulations that work because we have that clean slate in which to, to play on. So it gives us a, a huge advantage. So I think, uh, you know, putting, putting all of that together is really our, our approach to, to uh, what you're calling e-residency, but we see it as something much more multifaceted. Thank you. There's a lot there. So I want to, I want to pivot over to, to Lorraine and Otus on this because, and, and some of the, some of the deeper implications of this. Um, so, you know, mentioning, um, yeah, the, you know, the, the ability to sort of uh, project uh, holograms or others into into spaces. That makes me think of you know the the, the dystopian the truly dystopian version of that one is the filmmaker Alex Rivera's Sleep Dealer from 2008. He recently won a MacArthur Genius Grant, where he imagined a completely closed U.S. Mexican border where workers in Mexican maquiladoras, the special trade zone factories, now use cybernetics and virtual reality to operate robotics in the United States. So their labor is there, but they are denied the rights of immigration. And so, uh, Lorena, too, so I'd love your your thoughts on this because there's a whole other strain of thinking in addition to Paul but also Dmitry Kachanov, who writes about passport apartheid, and Branko Milanovic, also of the World Bank, who writes that you know, citizenship is a rent, meaning that it's basically used as a club by nations to prevent people from opportunities. How, how, do we, how do we use these kinds of e-residency, these emerging forms of digital presence as well, to create opportunities for refugees and other migrants and not just simply use it as another way to extract labor out of them without giving them sort of equal rights? Is, how, how do we think about these as places where rather than just sort of catchment areas or ways to keep them out of nation states, can we use these tools to bring them in? And obviously, Lorraine, I'd love to hear from you first because this seems like a central plank of your work as well about you know, how do we make them full participants ultimately in these societies versus simply exploiting them through remote work? Well, I think that's the question of the hour, and perhaps that was my question to everyone. In, I mean, we talk about all of the, you know, the digital nomads, the sort of e-residencies, but this is still only accessing to people in positions of privilege. And if we think that 82 million displaced people globally, none, very, very few of these could ever access these spaces. And I think, you know, and, and I think this is something that we have to really understand, you know, try to grapple with how can we create equity? Because as you know, as remote work accelerates, as these as cities like like, like Neon become a reality, as sort of e-residencies and you know and Bobby is digital nomad visas, we are we are we are increasing the gulf between those who have access and those who can access, whether it's because of education, whether it's because of language ability, whether it's because of networks and connections. Um, so these people will have access to these spaces, be it virtual or physical, and there are others who will still be left out. So I fear that it's actually accelerating the gulf between those who don't ha do have access, in, you know, because of they already have a they already have the passport and, or or they have the money to buy a passport, you know, as I said, you know, as as, as Henley and partners um, do. So how can we then create a system that, that is truly equitable and you know, and and um, and and Mansuri mentioned the sort of subscription. The people that we're thinking about have no way to access funds to get the subscription. So how do we make it equitable? And for me, that's the biggest problem that I see within this space. Yes, I promote. Uh, yes, I I promote remote work for refugees as a way, for, you know, to address the situation now because the way it is now needs to be changed. Needs to be reconceptualized. However, moving forward, as we, you know, as this become more norm becomes more normalized, how can we then create a more equitable system for everyone? And that's where I, where, where I, where, where the big dilemma I think comes in. Thank you. I want to hear from Atusa and then Mansoura, you have your virtual hand up, so we'll come back. But but Atusa, if you could quickly touch upon this, because Milanovic, uh, again, former chief economist with the World Bank, uh, has talked about in one of his books, Citizenship Light, the idea that, you know, that perhaps we need new forms of citizenship to diffuse some of the political tensions. Perhaps some of these e-residencies and these new advanced zones or that form of citizenship light, is that an effective or is that a sort of poison chalice? Because that's another problematic measure as you outline some of the problematicness of, the, uh, of Romer's concepts. Yes, citizenship light. I mean, there's two two forms of it. I think Milanovic, Branko Milanovic, um, was talking about it in the context of actual movement of bodies into one from one country to another. Um, and I think what what he's essentially what he was describing is the kafala system that you have in a number of Gulf states, where um, it's really it takes a really long time. It's not impossible. It takes a really long time to get citizenship, and you're sponsored by an employer, and so your sort of civil and political rights are, there's a cap. You can have a perfectly nice life, you can't vote, there's a few things you can't do, but you can work, you can be safe, you can, you know, 
it's it's certainly an improvement depending on where you're coming from. Um, another, I get, but I guess what you what you hinted at is another form of citizenship light is that you can participate remotely and contribute to a country's economy and um, you know even civic life from abroad, but then never have the ability to go back in. This is already happening, not in not in dystopian movies. Um, if you if you've followed at all um, those sort of patterns of deportations from the U.S., there's a whole bunch of essentially Americans, right? People who've lived in the U.S. for so long get deported, and now they're working in call centers um, south of the border for U.S. companies. Um, they sound American. They don't talk to people. Like they have sports. Like they, they watch NFL together. So is that citizenship light is Catholicism citizenship play like what what does it look like it can take many forms because citizenship can take many forms um I, I think that's the sort of crux of the issue is these things are are very mutable um so I hope I'm answering your question uh thank you well, well we yeah. have a few minutes left I have one more for you too so but a few more for for us Mansoor you had a quick response to I think Lorraine yeah, please just, yeah I just wanted to clarify I mean Certainly when I talk about a subscription doesn't mean that everybody has to pay. So of course it's a tiered subscription. And the idea is to provide digital access to those who are deprived of it today. And that's what we'll be offering you know, across Africa and the Middle East. But what it really is is creating opportunity. And you mentioned, for example, call centers, but another, another area is the AI industry where you have lots of people who are working in African countries who are simply classifying cats and dogs on photos for the AI industry. But they have no, that's all they're contributing. They have no access to the actual economy itself. So what we'd like to do is to transform that, give free access for the people who, who are on that ladder, but then give the opportunity for them to be creative, to be human, to create their own content that will then go into the metaverse and then they, they can then monetize for themselves. So it's really to, to, first of all, provide that digital access to the people in need and then provide them the opportunity to actually uh, take their own destiny in their hands once they have that digital access to be able to create value for themselves. So it's, it's really creating opportunities rather than anything else. Great. All right. Quickly, uh, I, were, I know we're almost out of time here. I've got at least two more questions. One's from Francesca Burks at Woods Bagot. How are digital nomad visas being adopted or not adopted by the formal economy? Are mature organizations using them as a tool given the current market competitiveness for talent? To which I would add, and I'd love to hear from Ruth and then Gabriel on this, um, you know, traditionally economic development and also the free zone model, the, you know, the Greenfield City model was about luring corporations with less regulation. And under remote work and, and, and e-residency, it's about literally individuals making choices based on quality of life or other choices there. So I'm curious, how does e-residency intersect with your yeah, talent attraction and tourism and economic development now that it's about winning individual hearts and minds of people to come there or participate in the economy versus you know, simply you know, doing low cost, lo low tax, low regulations for corporations? So, so Ruth, yeah, I, you know, how, how are you, how does this intersect with the rest of Estonia's efforts to bring people there, there, either digitally or physically? Uh, we don't expect uh, a direct economic effect uh, of the digital nomad uh, visa program. It's uh, one of our e-society uh, programs. Um, so we only expect uh, about uh, uh, 1,800 digital nomads uh, per year. So it's kind of an exclusive program, but uh, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's just making Estonia bigger, uh, bigger and more known. This is why we have our digital nomad uh, program. And when we designed it, we, we did it uh, together with the digital nomad uh, community. So uh, more, more than a thousand people answered our questionnaire. Uh, so it's uh, really a tailor-made regulation and combined uh, with other uh, Estonian e-society programs, it's, uh, you know, just uh, one piece that uh, fits so well in the puzzle. Thank you. And then Gabriel, I mean, obviously, you know, Barbados launched it because of its tourism, but, but I can imagine, I mean, is the ultimate plan in, in some ways to create a, you know, a, a Dubai on the Caribbean? I mean, obviously Miami and Dubai and others have used this uh, same strategy very uh, effectively to lure individuals there because of uh, similar like minds, et cetera. But I I'm curious, you know, wh what's the sort of evolution of what your portfolio is and then and think about the metaverse, but also intersection with Barbados's tourism and economic development in the long run? Um, well, I think they are complementary. I do see them as two very different programs. Um, and I don't see a reason why you can't have multiple programs running uh, consecutively with each other. Because on one hand, you have people who come to Barbados because of the safe environment, the beautiful lifestyle, 
the year round sunny weather, the beautiful beaches, the white sands. So persons are coming there to get away from uh, whatever current climate conditions or reasons that they may have to want to enjoy a, a beautiful lifestyle. Um, but in the other end, uh, there's a possibility of creating a new world for those who can't make it to Barbados and who maybe want to embark on uh, enterprise that requires a digital environment fully. And the two can go hand in hand. You know, you have one set of people who want to be there physically and another set of people who really just want to experience the virtual benefits that may come uh, with a metaverse environment. And then the, the way that I see us and this is now putting on a personal hat is, you know, we can think about these physical spaces uh, where laws are written and those laws are oftentimes, uh, yeah, very easy to adapt and amend and whatnot. Um, but ultimately you still have that physical confinement. When we, when we think about the metaverse and these virtual environments and you have a area that maybe one, two, three or 50 governments are participating in jointly, if a law was to be changed that others didn't agree with, technology is so beautiful that you can fork it and you move from one joint city to another, uh, literally with a click of a button. And, and that's kind of the way that, that I'm seeing this future um, heading towards is one where sovereign governments enter into multilateral relationships with several other governments. And out of this, you might have several meta cities uh, being formed with various types of laws in accordance to uh, A, B, or C choice. And I really see that becoming the standard and the norm that we are looking towards. And I expect that Barbados should be a front runner in these new types of initiatives where we don't experiment on the physical limitations of our land, uh, but we experiment on the infinite possibilities of technology. That's fascinating because it occurred to me, or I've been interested in the subject, is in the sense of that with remote work and e-residency and nomad visas, that we would see nation states or cities com increasingly compete on their own benefits. So just of course across the, the, the strait from Tallinn, you know, Helsinki's launched a 90-day fin program where they advertise rather than you know beaches and low taxes, come here where we have excellent schools and free healthcare, you know, and watching every region compete. But yes, Gabriel, you're taking that even further where we'll literally see governments basically carve out their own sovereign and compete against themselves potentially, which is an even fascinating, more, more fascinating development. Um, we're at time here, but I wanna go one more question, which Atus has asked me to ask. So I'll put it to you first, Atusa, on this, because I think it's an appropriate place to sort of weave this trilogy of events here and looking even further. And as Atusa noted, and she's been writing about this, you know, that, um, you know, uh, that, you know, the ultimate notion of a greenfield city, of course, you know, again, was carving land out of existing sovereignties. Then we saw seasteading and other efforts to create new systems of government independent of nation states in international territory, um, international waters in that, re in that regard. Now we have, a, a, you know, space billionaires and other businesses that are trying to get out into space where it's testing international law there. Um, and, you know, as Atusa notes, you know, the UN's decided that no country can claim the entire oceans. It cannot claim all of space or even Antarctica for that matter. Um, but will we get similar conventions on the metaverse and on these digital technologies to ensure that no single entity attempts to control them, that we still have some sort of combination of sovereignty and movement and rights there? And I don't know, I'd love to, I'd love to hear thoughts from any of our panelists. Again, Atusa, I'll call upon you briefly first, uh, since, since you wanted to frame this and you've been thinking about Jeff Bezos wanting to launch an office park in space effectively. Well, I'm asking the question because I actually don't know the answer because for the oceans, for outer space, even Antarctica, like there's there's there there, right? There's like a thing that has weight. And the metaverse is very different kind of of entity because it's technically infin infinite. So um, are we going to end up having the same conversations about who controls the internet, what kinds of laws we have on eBay, et cetera, et cetera? Or are we going to have something more like, you know, the Convention on the Law of the Sea or the Moon Treaty and the Outer Space Treaty? That's a question for all of you um, who have actual um, roles with governments. I could take a stab at that by saying, you know, this is why decentralized technologies are so important and why I'm such a big fan of things like blockchain. It's because you don't have a single country, character, corporation in control of these environments. So when I speak of the ideal metaverse, it's one that's decentralized, 
um, completely, like the decentral lands, the sawmill spaces, the sandboxes. And these are just the initial uh, technologies that we're seeing birth around the space. And I think there will be more and probably um, the technology would get better and better. But the way I see it is this allows a nation state to start um, embarking on different types of environments where the limitations of the physical uh, land is no longer there. And therefore, you can be uh, much more creative in how you go about embarking on these new types of environments. And in addition to that, you're not limited to one environment because it is virtual. You can launch several different initiatives. Um, one A can have one type of law and B can have an entirely different type of law. C can have different countries that are participation. Barbados might enter metaverse participation uh, with the Middle East on, on part C, but on part A, it might do one that's just the Caribbean nations. And in part D, it might do one that's all nations. And the reality is you don't have a constraint when you're dealing with these virtual environments. And even more specifically, you're not, you're not dictated to when you're working with decentralized technologies. So you have the ability to enact your sovereign will, your identity and your image on your own creativity of how you see these future environments working, how they look, what types of laws they observe, and who participates within them. Thank you, Mansuri. You have your hand up, please. Yeah, no, I totally agree that you know the the infinite opportunities offered by technology, as Gabriel put them, gives us a massive opportunity to explore our own identities and freedoms, and effectively, uh, you know, I think that the multi multi um, the metaverses that are being built should interwork. Um, you have always got a choice of where you want to be, but even in a single metaverse like the cognitive verse, we will have public spaces, private spaces, and multiple user spaces where you can interact with user groups to create, to decide which reality you want to see. Now, the beauty of that is that not only will those be individual spaces in the metaverse, but actually you can do that at the same time in the same space. So effectively, you can, in, in a single uh, public space, for example, if you don't like what you're seeing as a public space, you can just switch to your own private space, but only you can see it then. And then you actually decide that you've got 20, 30 people who share the same tastes, and you invite them in. So all of that in a single platform, you can actually have that coexisting and actually learn from that and understand then from the, the state level, where do you need to intervene just to protect individuals humanity and, and privacy, et cetera. So the possibilities are endless and it's gonna be fascinating to see how it evolves. One final question is I would love to hear from Lorraine and Ruth again before we conclude, but uh, obviously I forget the name of the exact diplomat, Lorraine, but I know that after the end of World War I, there was you know, large numbers of stateless people across Europe and, and a diplomat actually created a sort of lightweight passport for the stateless. Is, is there a way, is, is there in these technologies uh, a, a way to create a sort of new form of stateless citizenship for these refugees or others, or how we might actually create a universal set of e-residency rights or, or, you know, or, or some sort of nomad visa rights for the stateless in this regard. And, and Ruth, I'd love to hear as well, your thoughts on like how Estonia could be or other nation states a participant in this. But, but yeah, Lorraine, to your earlier points about equity of this, you know, these technologies are amazing, but, you know, how can we at least use this as a, as a crowbar to, you know, offer some rights and, and, um, and some equity, of course, to the stateless and to the refugees? That's really that's a really interesting question because a lot of people are stateless because where because the state in, in which they physically are isn't safe to host them. So it's you know having a virtual citizenship, having a you know virtual residency is great, but but, but we have to also think about the physicality of it. They have to be somewhere safe, and and for most people, safety comes with living in a place where they have the right to be, and you know and. Atosa, you mentioned the, um, the Kafala system. Yes, people live in the Gulf for years without, without, res without citizenship, but it's a form of permanent, permanent temporariness. You never feel secure because at any point you can be deported, extracted. So yes, virtual citizenship is good in terms of economic development, you know, in, in, in terms of economic integration, but we still can't, can't forget that, that we need the physical as well. Physical safety is just as important. 
Thank you. And then uh, Ruth, any conclude conclude your remarks on this on yes on either the stateless question or elsewhere about you know how again how, you know how we, what what these new archipelagos of, of citizenship and belonging might look like or you know I mean because of course we have traditional economic pacts the EU ASEAN others but this points to sort of all new confederations or configurations of of how states might work together and how uh, residents or nomads or refugees might move between them. Uh, yeah, first of all, in uh, uh, in Europe, uh, all the social rights are the same when a person uh, is a resident uh, of uh, one of the member states. Uh, so uh, our uh, people with uh, undetermined citizenship uh, are because they could get Estonian citizenship. But uh, yeah, of course, they, are, they have to know Estonian language uh, and, and there are some rules. Uh, but, but basically, all the social rights are, are the same. I know it's uh, not everywhere in the world, and uh, I know there are a lot of refugees uh, and uh, just displaced people. Uh, yeah, it, it could be uh, an opportunity for these people uh, as well to uh, use uh, you know, remote services. Uh, but, but I absolutely uh, agree with Lorraine that the physical uh, safety has to be there as well. And to use digital services, you have to have a computer, you have to have internet. It's not so obvious like it is uh, uh, for us. But no, definitely I'm, a way to think. No, absolutely. Well, thank, thank you so much for that. We'll leave it there on that, on that very cautiously hopeful note for that. But, uh, but thank you all so much. I mean, the, the, the big takeaway I have for this, and of course, for this entire series, because this is the final episode here, is that, you know, that these greenfield cities and the trade zones before them uh, were efforts to use physical space to carve out the sort of again, extra territoriality, the places to experiment. And now we're seeing, you know, with the rise of these various technologies, the metaverse, Web3, uh, e-residency and digital nomads and others, is that, you know, they're blurring there, of course, you know, we're seeing, uh, you know, the fact that you can have these experimentations without actual territoriality, or you can see the combination of these technologies with territoriality in the form of, you know, potential metaverse applications, holograms, etc. So yeah, the, the whole fundamental premise that the zone was the place where you would experiment or separate itself out is now being unbundled across multiple dimensions of time and space in a different direction. So uh, it's a fascinating way to conclude the series. I want to thank all of our panelists again, uh, as I see them in counterclockwise, as Mansour, Lorraine, Ruth, Atusa, and Gabriel. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Thank you all so much for watching. And hopefully we'll be back in 2022 with more of these explorations. But thank you all so much. Have a wonderful end of the year and we'll talk to you soon.